Are you preparing to become a PA or just considering the field? Are you wondering how to apply successfully? Our guest today is the Associate Program Director at the first USPA program, and she's going to tell you all about it. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Acceptance founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 416th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for joining me today. This interview is all about getting accepted to PA school, specifically the Duke PA program. In addition to listening to today's interview, I'd like to invite you to download Accepted's free guide, 10 Tips for Acceptance to Physician Assistant Programs. Grab your free copy for advice on selecting the best PA program for you, writing your personal statement, interviewing effectively, and simply presenting the best application you possibly can. Download 10 Tips for Acceptance to a Physician Assistant Program from accepted.com slash PA 10 tips. Again, that's accepted.com slash PA 10 tips. Today's guest, April Stouter, earned her bachelor's at Manchester College and her master's of health science in Duke's PA program in 2000. From 2002 to 12, she worked as a PA at Duke. From 2012 to 2018, she was director of clinical education at Duke University, and she has served as associate program director and chair of the admissions committee since June 2018. April, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you so much for having me, Linda. I'm really excited to be here today. Well, I'm excited that you could be here today. Can you give us to start, can you just give us an overview of the Duke PA program, fo focusing on its more distinctive elements? Sure thing. Um, well, most PA programs are two years in length and ours is no different. Um, perhaps what distinguishes us a little bit is our primary care focused mission. Um, not every PA program is distinctly focused on primary care, but that is a big part of our mission to train primary care PAs. Um, we are one of the programs that's been around the longest. We were the first, uh, first established in 1965, and we had a class of four graduates in 1967, and then the profession took off from there. So that's part of our proud history and, um, you know, always something that we like to bring up, but we're definitely not a program that rests on our historic laurels. We're definitely a program that likes to evolve and improve along the way. Um, we are one of the larger programs in the country. We have uh, 90 students per cohort, a total of 180 students at any given time, and approximately 40 faculty and staff. So my program director always says we're like a giant cruise ship, a big vessel in the ocean um, chugging along. So we're a big program, and that does distinguish us um, from a lot of programs out there. We're also housed at an academic medical center. There are other programs at academic medical centers, but that does distinguish us from some of the programs out there as well. Okay, great, thank you. And the curriculum in terms of one-year didactic instruction and one-year clinical, is that pretty typical for all PA programs? That is pretty typical. There's a few programs out there um, that are a little bit longer in length, maybe start someone in their junior or senior year of college, and then they go straight into the PA program. Mm -hmm. But the more typical now, because the terminal degree is the master's degree, is that most folks have finished their bachelor's uh, studies, and then they come to PA school as a graduate program, two years in length. Got it. Okay. Now, COVID, of course, has affected every aspect of our lives, every nook and cranny of our lives. Yes. How has COVID affected the Duke PA program, both the didactic portion and the clinical portion? Boy, COVID really did a number on medical education across the country, and, and we were certainly no exception to that. Um, in the spring of last year, um, we had students out on their clinical rotations, and we had a first-year cohort of students that were used to coming into the classroom and to our labs every day. And in roughly the beginning of April, um, we had to pull students off of their clinical rotations, um, and as the community at large was dealing with sort of an influx of sick patients. And so for the protection of students and also just to spare uh, personal pr protective equipment, um, that had to be prioritized for practicing healthcare professionals. So our second year students came off rotations and we kind of hit the pause button as we quickly figured out what could we do to help them continue to move through the program 
we created a, several virtual electives that they could participate in, um, focusing on things like public health, leadership, um, getting extra training on substance use disorder. Students could opt into whatever elective kind of piqued their interest. Um, and then in the uh, first year, we had to quickly pivot our in-person, largely in-person curriculum to a virtual curriculum. So we had to get up to speed very quickly with Zoom and other technologies um, and pivot our curriculum to um, either live synchronous sessions on Zoom or pre-recorded sessions. Um, incredibly, our second year students were able to get back out on rotations um, and actually finish the program just a couple of weeks past their original completion date in August. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Um, they were incredibly grateful to not be really, really delayed. Um, and those virtual electives did help them continue to complete um, coursework and move along in the program until they could get back out on clinical rotations. And then our first year students actually started their second year in July on time. And they have been out on rotations um, in a pretty normal fashion. Um, many of our clinical rotation sites came back on, uh, on board um, pretty quickly and we're willing to take our students back. And then we started a new cohort of students, uh, the class of 2022 in August, and they have been for the most part virtual, but we are doing a hybrid curriculum and prioritizing in-person activities such as our anatomy lab and physical diagnosis lab. Right, right. Do you hope, when do you think the, the didactic portion will be in-person again? I would love to say that this fall, when we have a new cohort coming in in August, mm -hmm. um, that we can have a lot more in-person activities. Um, I think it just depends on what COVID activities are doing in the state of North Carolina. Um, a number of our students are starting to get vaccinated. Our, our clinical year students were prioritized for that. Um, first year students have actually been volunteering in Duke's COVID vaccine clinic. Mm -hmm. And if they volunteer, they were eligible if they had supply to get vaccinated. So. I think we're still waiting for direction from the institution and from the state, the governor's office to see what's yeah. feasible come August, but we want to get back to some more face-to-face -face activities and back in our building. I think everybody does. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no matter where or what, that's for uh, sure. That normalcy, we're just dying to get yeah. back to it. Yeah. But, for you know, sure. I think we're having conversations as a faculty about what of this year, what have we learned? what of this hybrid um, curriculum delivery do we want to keep? Because some of it's been really great and really well received by the students, that extra like autonomy and flexibility. These are adult learners. And so having students in the classroom all day long really doesn't work for them. Um, so we'll be having a lot of discussions this summer about what is the next um, academic year going to look like for our didactic students, because it's not going to look the same as it always has, I can about guarantee. Right. I actually, as you were talking, I was, I was, that was going to be my question. Has there been a silver lining to this? There has been. Yeah. So out of crisis comes innovation. Um, and I think where maybe we had had resistance in the past to doing more virtual instruction from either staff or resource allocation or faculty saying, I can't learn yet another new skill. We were all forced to learn new skills. Yeah. And so now we know we can do it. Um, and so the question now is, where can, be re where can we be really um, deliberate in where the, it makes the most sense to continue doing some of this hybrid or virtual curriculum delivery? Right, that makes sense. Now, Duke is using the CASPA application. Can you review the timeline for applications and kind of how they're processed uh, at Duke's PA program? Yeah, every PA program has a little bit of a different timeline in terms of their start dates and their CASPA dates. So for us, CASPA always opens in April. This year, it'll open on April 30th, um, and it'll close September 1st. Along the way, um, when students complete their CASPA application and send it to Duke, we'll send them a supplemental application that's unique to our program. The supplemental is due by October 1st. Um, anyone who's applying to our program, we have a deadline of July 1st to complete the minimum prerequisite of 1,000 patient care hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then the GRE deadline for our program is September 15th. That's just so to they make can sure. apply. they can apply before they take the GRE? Uh -huh. Is that a second GRE that they could? Um, so they can apply before they take the GRE. They just need to get us their GRE scores by September 15th in order for their CASPA to be complete and that supplemental to be sent to them. And Got then it. the supplemental deadline needs to be done by um, October 1st. 
All right. And so the, 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 you get the supplemental by October 1st, you get the mm-hmm. GRE, basically you have everything yep. by October 1st. And then what happens? Do you wait till October 1st to start processing? I assume not. It's rolling oh, admissions, no. right? right? No, we get, we get way too many applications. To yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have rolling admissions. So really, once we start getting completed supplemental applications, we have an admissions team that begins looking at those applications and making sure that they meet all of our prereqs, uh, make, meet basic criteria that would allow them to move ahead and sort of go into the reading pool. Um, And we have faculty alums um, who help us with um, reading our applications. Um, And so each application that comes in um, gets reviewed by our program. It's a lot of reviewing and we need a big chunk of time to get through all of those applications. Over 4,000, right? Yeah. So um, 4,000 was maybe our peak. That was, I think, with the incoming class of 2020. That was the most CASPA applications we'd ever received. Now, it drops off after there because not everyone who submits a CASPA application submits a completed supplemental. Usually about half the people who do a CASPA complete a supplemental. Oh, right. Um, So last cycle, we were worried what COVID was going to do to our numbers, and we actually had more applications um, come in. So 2020 was sort of the peak, and then it dropped off in 2019, and then this this cycle... um, so, sorry, 2019, 2018 was the peak, 2019 dropped off, 2020, we went up, um, okay. and we all just held our breath because we had no idea what COVID was going to do to our numbers. Um, so we had about 3,100 um, CASPA applications, and we had about 2,200 completed supplementals, and of those 2,200, about 1,400 of them ended up going into the reading pool to be read by two faculty members and scored. What's the criteria for going into the reading pool? So you have to meet our prereqs. Um, If you don't meet prereqs, we don't even move it forward. Um, And then we have um, some objective measures that sort of help us delineate those 2,200 applications because there's no way we can, you know, really read in depth 2,200. Um, So some objective criteria based on academic performance, patient care experience, um, natural science credits, And then that sort of gives us a rough number, an objective score, um, and then anything that's above a certain threshold goes into the general reading pool. Again, that's about 1,400 applications that that make it into that pool. And what are the um, academic uh, stats or background that you like to see? I mean, I know you have specific requirements. Those are on the the website. Sure. But um, in terms of GRE, the GPA, that kind of stuff. So we're not a program that has hard cutoffs for GPA or GRE. Um, we have we utilize a holistic approach to our admissions review, um, meaning that we sort of are looking at academics in context to someone's life experience. Um, mm-hmm. We know there's a lot of folks out there who maybe. Uh, their first generation college student, or they had big events that happened to them in college. And so maybe they had a rough start to their freshman year or, um, you know, had a traumatic experience in college and they had a dip one semester. Um, So we really look sort of at the evolution of the student over their college career. Do they have an upward trend to their grades? Um, You know, if somebody fails a course or uh, doesn't do well one semester, that's really not a deal breaker. Um, sometimes someone may have a little bit lower GPA, but their GRE is great or vice versa. Um, so I, I think we're looking for people who have shown grit and tenacity um, okay. and growth and evolution as a student and as a person. Um, and, you know, oftentimes they can give us that context in their life experience essay. Um, and so that helps us really take a look at, well, what's their story? You know, what happened here their freshman year? But look, they've really grown over the course of their college. So we don't, we don't necessarily require that somebody is a science major. In fact, we have a lot of people who were not science majors, those maybe who are actually doing a second career um, or who maybe just have a lot of interest. And so it's not unheard of that we have English majors or art history majors or philosophy majors who decide, hey, I want to go into medicine and PA looks pretty good. Um, that's all part of their journey and their evolution. And we love to hear those stories. Everybody has to have the prereq science courses. Those are outlined on our website and pretty similar to PA programs across the country. We love to see students who've who've been successful in upper level science courses, rigorous courses. 
Um, but, you know, we're also just not looking for those people who are just the, the 4.0 straight A's, peak GREs, um, because a lot of those folks don't have some of the sort of life experiences, work experiences. Um, so there's a lot of diversity in our classroom in terms of the educational background, the work history, and the life experiences. And that's what makes our learning environment so rich. What kind of clinical experience is the Duke PA program seeking? I know that you want a minimum of 1,000 hours. Mm -hmm. And I was very impressed by the fact that your students have multiples of that. Oh, yes. Um, so typically, I'd say the average is about 18 months, um, but we certainly have people who have 10 years of clinical experience. So um, I would say if somebody has just the thousand hours, they may be less competitive and it might actually benefit them to wait a year to apply and get another year of clinical experience under their belt. Um, so we're looking for students who are applicants who have hands-on clinical experiences. Um, particularly attractive are those uh, clinical roles where maybe they had to get some extra education or licensure, like an EMT or a certified nursing assistant, RN. Um, there are a number of roles where there's just sort of advanced responsibility um, in terms of patient care and decision making. That's always very attractive. Um, but, you know, you can't beat a clinical experience where you really have had to get into the nitty gritty of taking care of somebody. So a tech in the hospital, a CNA in a nursing home, a medical assistant in a clinic, those are all very popular patient care roles um, and are really attractive to us because I think it allows somebody to evaluate is patient care truly for me. What about scribing? Is that not hands on enough? So we do actually take scribing. I, I think there are some programs out there who don't. Um, and we've actually seen kind of an evolution of the scribe role to more of a hybrid medical assistant role. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Um, although we do count just straight up scribing, even though it's not hands-on. And those students actually tend to do really well in their medical knowledge or medical documentation. Sure. <laughs> um, they, they really know their staff because they also have been right in the thick of it and actually communicate a lot with the provider about their medical decision making. So they've been exposed to a lot. Okay. And what about non-clinical community service? Um, is, that, is that relevant? Uh, we love community service and a record of volunteerism. Um, that actually aligns a lot with our mission. So we're really looking for applicants who have demonstrated leadership, involvement, or service in their community, um, that they value um, diversity and inclusion, either through their volunteer, their lived experiences, their educational experiences. Um, all of those things are really important to us. And so someone who has a demonstrated record of service in the community, and there is a place on the CASPA for you to record your volunteer or service hours, um, particularly if you have a record of service with underserved communities or populations, that very much aligns to the mission of our program and actually the mission of the PA profession and why it was created. Yeah. Um, so we love to see that as part of an application. All right. Now, you, and you, we kind of touched on this, but I'm going to ask a question anyways. Now, Duke's website says that you, we, we discussed that it received, I guess the peak was 4,000, right? And mm -hmm. um, then it, it gets winnowed down to 14, 1,400 based on objective criteria. And then you interview about 250. So mm -hmm. that's about 20%, maybe a little, little off from that. I'm doing it in my head. And ultimately you'll matriculate 90. How do you winnow it down. I mean, the 1400 seemed like you, you're, it's fairly objective, mm -hmm. but from the 1400 to the 250. <laughs> so um, there's the objective score based on some of those objective criteria. And then the readers have a rubric and they evaluate as well. And they're really taking that context into consideration, reading the essays, looking at the letters of recommendation, looking at the whole picture, their community service, um, have they been exposed to the PA profession, either through shadowing or working with PAs? Do they know what they're getting into? Do they talk about that in their essays? Um, and so we're, we're evaluating folks on, are they making an informed decision? And do we think that this person would bring value as a cohort in the class, either through some of their work experiences, life experiences? Um, and then those scores get combined with the objective score and then kind of an overall score is created. And um, we have a certain number of interview slots based on that final score um, and then fill our interview slots when we interview about 250 people. 
Got it. So you actually, you try and quantify, you, you rate people and it's this quantity, this scoring system that determines it. All right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what is the interview day at Duke's PA program like, especially in the time of COVID? Is it a day or is it an interview or is it interviews on different days? How is that working? So COVID definitely pushed us to our technology limits. We had to, <laughs> we had to virtualize our admissions process, as did almost every program in the country, I think. Yeah. Um, it was a big topic of conversation at the National PA Education um, uh, Annual Meeting, which was also virtual, talking about how people did that. But um, I would say in um, this is also another thing that we're looking at in terms of what, what of this do we keep for our next cycle? Mm-hmm because it's actually very cost friendly for applicants um, to be able to do virtual admissions interviews. We got great feedback from our applicants and they said, we really feel like we were able to get to know the program, get to know the faculty, get all of our questions answered. Um, And particularly if we are interested in recruiting students from disadvantaged or underrepresented backgrounds, we know that travel and cost for interviews is very expensive. So we're keeping that in the back of our mind as we make our decisions about the coming year and what format we're going to keep. But so a virtual um, interview week, um, the applicants were assigned a specific day to interview, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Monday, late afternoon, we had information session. Um, We sent out pre-recorded videos that sort of went over highlights of our curriculum, both the first and second year. And then we held a Q&A session. So they were supposed to watch those videos and come ready with their questions. And they always have lots of great questions. That's hosted by our faculty um, representatives from both the first and second year teams. Um, Monday night, there was a student hosted uh, Q&A session. So what's it like to be a Duke PA student? And there's no faculty or staff there. Um, So they can come and get their questions answered. And then they show up on their interview day uh, virtually. And they had two um, individual interviews. And that could be with a faculty member. That could be with a preceptor that sees a lot of our students, an alum. Um, We have a a variety of folks who come and help us with interviews. Um, So two one-on-one interviews. And then there's a team process exercise, which is a small group scenario, usually about four to five applicants in a group. Um, It's facilitated and observed by one faculty or alum or preceptor, and then one currently enrolled student. And they're given a scenario, um, and then they're meant to chat and talk through it. Um, And we purposely choose kind of ethical scenarios or maybe something that's a little controversial. And it's not meant to rate their knowledge of the topic. It's meant to really look at their team skills, their interpersonal skills. Um, And it's really interesting sometimes how people behave in that scenario. (laughs) Um, So there's three main components to our interview day. This is true also in in in-person interviews. Um, And then one thing that we added um, this year because of virtual admissions, um, on Thursday night, we added a diversity and inclusion discussion. Again, this was hosted by students. um, And it was a question, it was an opportunity for applicants who really wanted to know, what's it like maybe to be a student of color or a first generation student who's coming to Duke? What kind of learning environment is Duke and how is Durham as a place to live? to get their questions answered. What does it like to be a parent or what kind of resources are there for veterans? Um, That was very well received by our applicants. And I definitely think we'll be keeping that as a component of um, our admissions weeks moving forward. Um, So I think applicants appreciate that time with students to really get to the nitty gritty of what's it like to be a student here, but also just get all their questions answered from faculty and feel really supported and, you know, I think get a feel for our culture. Did you, did you use the MMI before COVID? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been part of our process for years now. So, so that kind of got put to the side because during COVID, right? Or, or did I miss it? We don't do MMI. It's that team process exercise. So Mm -hmm. we just virtualized that and we're able to do a breakout room in Zoom and it still worked beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. We, for, uh, some business schools have team-based discussions and we, mm-hmm. we've we done mock team-based discussions. And uh, yes, it is very revealing. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've sat in on a few of them. It can be very, very revealing. Um, 
Is there anything that you look for throughout the application process, not just the interview, either in the essays or the supplementals or the interview or the recs for that matter, that you didn't look for one, two, five, ten years ago? Yeah, I think um, in the last at least five years, um, we really have honed in on that focus to uh, the focus of our program match to mission. Um, so again, looking at applicants who have demonstrated leadership, have demonstrated um, uh, grit and tenacity um, in overcoming mm -hmm. obstacles in their life. Um, and, you know, people talk about that in their essays a lot. Um, sometimes their letters of recommendation reveal things like, wow, this person really overcame a difficult time and, and came out on the other end of that um, really positively. Um, I think we're looking for maturity um, and how they respond to difficult situations. And I think some of our interview questions can get to that. Um, we're looking for folks, uh, the profession was built uh, off of the backs of uh, military veterans who were corpsmen um, in the Vietnam really? War. And so mm. veterans are really an attractive um, potential student for us and for other PA programs across the country. So we love that. Um, anyone who is a North Carolina native, we're a North Carolina-based school, and so um, we, we really like it when we get North Carolina applicants and, um, because we know that they're more likely to stay and, and help meet the healthcare needs of this local area. So, you know, I think, too, looking at does somebody have a record of volunteer service? Um, have they worked or done volunteer work with underserved populations or communities? Um, it, it really sort of gets to the heart of has this person either because of their life experiences, work experiences, volunteer experiences, do they have, have they developed empathy and an understanding of some of the challenges that their patients are likely to face? Um, our patients really come from all different backgrounds. We have an aging population in the U.S. We have an increasingly diverse population in the U.S. And we want to help train future PAs that sort of reflect that diversity um, and will go and be able to make connections with those patients in those communities um, because they understand what that's like themselves. Um, so that's important to us. And I think we look at that a lot more now than we have in years past as part of sort of that evaluation. Okay, great. And let just, just get kind of moving forward with the application process. Um, what about how does the Duke PA program respond to update letters or waitlist letters, mm -hmm. whether they are before the waitlist or before the interview or, you know, somebody submitted the supplemental and they don't hear back from you. The silence is driving them nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Should they send, and they have something they'd like you to know about. Should they send an update? Same situation after an interview, same situation after a waitlist. Yeah, we, we get those a lot um, in all of those scenarios. Um, and we absolutely encourage applicants to keep us updated if there's changes to their application, something new, something updated. You know, whatever they have submitted at the time of application completion, that's really what we're looking at. But it's not uncommon that someone may have a prerequisite course that's in progress. Um, applicants can have two prerequisites still in progress at the time that they apply. So they might send us updated transcripts or things like that. Um, sometimes we get um, external letters of recommendation from someone and we just add that to our file of recommendations. Um, People do give us updates that either maybe they've accepted a seat somewhere else, but they're still interested in us, or uh, where am I on the wait list? And when am I gonna hear about possible interviews? So we're very used to communicating. They just email us through our central um, email address that's located on our website, paadmissions at mc.duke.edu. And someone typically responds to them within 24 hours. We've got a whole team that helps man that inbox. Okay, all right. On a forward-looking note, what advice would you give to PA applicants, PA applicants rather, who want to apply this cycle? All mm -hmm. right, so you're going to open, I think, very soon, right? In yeah. April, right? What April was it? 30th. April 30th, right? Is what I had written down. Um, and time's coming, so the application is Im imminent. Mm -hmm. um, when the interview, when this interview airs, it should be May 4th. That's what we're planning for, okay. and right after the April 30th, you know, within days. What would you like listeners this cycle to know? 
So one thing that we often tell potential applicants is they want to submit the best application that they can. And sometimes that means waiting a year to apply. That is not always easy advice for someone to hear who's really excited about applying, really excited to start PA school and jumping into the profession. But keep in mind that applying to PA programs is expensive. It is an investment in and of itself. And so I really encourage people to take a hard look at some of the data that's on our website, what the middle 50th percent is for one of the past cohorts, and really take a look at patient care experience, number of natural science credits, GPAs, GRE, take a little self-assessment. Am I in range here? Or do I have a little bit more work that I need to do? Maybe I need to retake that GRE or maybe another year of patient care experience would sort of give me that bump up and make me a little bit more competitive. Um, maybe I don't have a record of service or leadership or you know anything like that. So take a comprehensive look. Um, and sometimes it's hard to be um, discerning of your own application because of your, your enthusiasm. But I think use the criteria we have on the website and really think about, is this the most competitive application that I can submit? Because keep in mind, PA programs across the country, this is very competitive. There's only a certain number of seats and we get lots of applications. PA was just rated number one per healthcare profession in the country. Wow. So the interest is tremendous and the capacity can't meet all the interest. Um, so you need to really have an application that makes you stand out in some way. Um, and I would say sometimes that means waiting a year and getting additional life and work experience or boning up on your academic credentials a little bit to make sure that you're the most competitive applicant at the time you're paying all that money and submitting your CASPA. Right. One of the things I, I kind of uh, was thinking about as, as you were talking is that where med, med applicants are not expected to have had a, a real job, if you will, when no. they apply. But my impression is that most PA, PA applicants are expected to have had a job in healthcare. It's, it's fairly rare that volunteer experience is sufficient. Is that correct? That is correct. Most programs do require patient care experience. Um, I think the average age at our program for our matriculating students is about 25 or 26, which is distinctly different from the typical 22, 23 year old that's starting med school. And that's not to say that we don't have students who fall into that age category in, in each of our cohorts, we do. Um, but they've been really proactive in getting patient care experiences while they were in college. Maybe they got EMT certified or worked in a nursing home, et cetera. So they knew what the requirements were ahead of time and were actively working to get, get those patient care hours. But typically people take a gap year, you know, they work for a year or two after college and get that really valuable experience and make sure that they've got, you know, a, a good chunk of life experience and work experience before they apply. And thinking ahead, what about those planning to apply for matriculation in 2022 or later? Actually, I think mm -hmm. we just talked about 2022, so it'd be even 2023 or later. Mm -hmm. These years are uh, catching up to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, my advice is similar in terms of just really honing in on um, submitting the best application that you can. But I think the other thing is just to make sure that you understand what you're getting into. And by that, I mean, do your homework. So maybe talk to somebody who um, is currently in a PA program and get an understanding of the rigor and the pace, the fast pace of PA education. By all means, seek out opportunities to talk to practicing PAs and not just one, but maybe PAs that work in different fields because I think the work of a PA looks very different if you work in an emergency room or if you work in an outpatient pediatrics office or if you work as a hospitalist doing internal medicine in the hospital all the time. Um, if you're a surgery PA versus critical care, et cetera. So understand the diversity of the profession and different scopes and roles. Um, really get a sense of, you know, what would life be like to do that job? And, and what does it mean to take care of patients? So get a good hands-on patient care job and make sure it's for you. Taking care of people is messy. Yeah, physically messy sometimes, can be emotionally messy. Um, you know, people are complex. And so... I would say just make sure that you've done your homework and that you know for sure that medicine and being intimately involved in your patients' lives is something that's for you. That seems like a no-brainer, but 
you'd be surprised by people who apply and they've never met a PA, never worked with a PA, never talked to a PA. They've only done their research online. And it kind of blows my mind that they're willing to invest that much money on education and not really have totally done your homework on what it means to be a PA. They might've just read the article about PA being the best That's healthcare right. field. Right? That's right. Yeah. Look maybe at this. a relative said you should go into healthcare and you know, you're never going to get past this path, right? right Two years right. and you're done. Right. There are, there are people who definitely fall into that category uh, and we sort them out pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet you would. Right. <laughs> and your, your requirements would for sure. Are there any misconceptions that you would like to dispel about the Duke PA program in particular or the PA program in general? Um, I think maybe two. So I mentioned earlier that we're a large program. And so I think we always get questions every year in those Q&A sessions. Um, and I know our students get questions about this. That's a really big program, 90 students per class. So am I really gonna get personalized attention? Am I gonna get the support that I need? Are people gonna know who I am? Um, and I would say, yes, absolutely. And I think our students would too, and they always do. Um, because we, as we have grown over the years, we have built in um, support structures to make sure that students are known by faculty, that they get to know each other. Um, we do a lot of small group work um, in the curriculum and we shift those small groups every semester so they get to know a subset of their class. Um, we have advising small groups, so every student has an advisor, and in the second year, they have a clinical coordinator, a faculty member, so they basically have two faculty supports once they move into the clinical year, um, and students can build relationships with whichever faculty, you know, they have a, a connection or yeah. maybe a similar clinical interest. Um, so we work really hard to make sure that that culture, it feels very inclusive, and that students feel known and um, accepted and appreciated for whatever they bring to the table. Um, the other thing is, um, I think sometimes um, our name and the fact that we're one of the top ranked programs in the country perhaps works against us uh, because there's a bit of an intimidation factor, I think, where maybe people say, ooh, that's one of the top programs maybe I won't even apply because I don't think I'd get in because I have maybe some aspect of my application is imperfect. I don't have a great GRE. I don't have a perfect GPA. Um, and I would say that we have students who sit in our class every single year who have imperfect GREs and GPAs, <laughs> but it's that holistic approach that we look at. So, you know, things happen in people's lives that impacts a GPA, and that can be hard to dig out of, but we're looking for those trends and improvement. We're looking for that grit and resiliency. Um, so I would say, keep in mind what our program mission is. Take a look at our social media accounts on Instagram and Facebook. Our students run our Instagram social media, and they really talk about sort of the culture and what it's like to be a student at Duke. And so if you personally as an applicant feel like you strongly align with our program mission, with our values, we want to see your application and don't be intimidated by our name or our ranking and don't make an assumption that we're only accepting people with 4.0s and perfect GREs because that is not the case. That's not the case. I guess you're saying don't reject yourself. That's right. Yeah. Put it out there. Right. What would you have liked me to ask you because we're almost at the end? Oh, gosh. Um, I, I think maybe I would have loved a question about um, diversity. Uh, diversity and inclusion has been a huge hot topic, uh, particularly in the last year or two with major national events. Um, we are also wrestling with some of those issues with systemic racism in our own program and our own institution and having really frank talks about that. Um, we have revised parts of our curriculum to really focus that in our um, PHS course, public, um, pop practice in the health system course, um, was completely overhauled this past year um, so that there were small group discussions about how does race and ethnicity, how does socioeconomic factor, how does um, disability play into health disparities? 
Um, and, you know, some of those are really hard conversations to have, but they're really necessary um, to train these students to go out and be competent PAs and to be able to meet their patients where they are and understand that there's a whole host of things that are impacting their world outside of that clinic or that hospital that may get in the way of that perfect treatment plan, right? Their, their life sometimes gets in the way of that. So how can we train PA students to be cognizant of that? Um, so I, I think we've been really intentional. We've got some things on our website and our social media accounts that really speak to some of the work that we're doing. That's never ending work. Um, and, and I just wanna acknowledge and, and thank the leadership of our program director, Dr. Jackie Barnett, who has done a lot of that work over her long career and her life um, and who's just been a phenomenal leader um, through all of these challenging and tumultuous times with COVID and so many of the events that have happened this year, this past year. It was quite a year. It really was. It really was. Else. April, I think we're almost out of time. It's been delightful talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me, sharing your expertise and the inf all the information about the Duke PA program. Where can listeners learn more about the program and about earning a Master's of Health Science at Duke? Well, they can um, always email at us at paadmission at mc.duke.edu. That's our general admissions email. We also have our general PA program website at FMCH, that's Family Medicine Community Health abbreviation, fmch.duke.edu, and then look for physician assistant program in our department. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our Instagram handle is at Duke PA students. And again, that's our student run fun Instagram. We'll be having admissions events, Facebook live events, and we always have uh, students take over Instagram for admissions as well. On, and so look for those announcements coming soon. Sounds good. Uh, we'll include links in the show notes at accept.com slash 416 to Duke's PA website, as well as to the Instagram account and some other resources that might be helpful to listeners. One of those resources is 10 Tips for Acceptance to Physician Assistant Programs, which is a free download from Accepted. Now that you want to be a PA more than ever, don't apply without having these tips in your hip pocket. It's easy. Go to accepted.com slash PA10 tips. Again, that's accepted.com slash PA10 tips, and you can download your copy. I also want to invite you to participate in the thank you for your review contest. One listener a month who leaves a podcast review on Apple Podcasts, in other words, iTunes, will win a free 20 minute consultation with me. You can leave your review at lovethepodcast.com slash AST. Again, that's lovethepodcast.com slash AST. I look forward to hearing from you and speaking with you. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. 